Hey there. Welcome to Real Guitar Live, and I am live tuning my guitar. That'll work. I'm Thomas Michaud, and my co-host, Ami Fields. Hey. We're going to entertain you and hopefully answer all your questions about learning and playing guitar. To start off, we're going to do a presentation. I'm going to talk about hey some there. things... <laughs> I'm going to talk about things that you can do to take care of your guitar. And some of them will be obvious and, you know, nothing, no brain science. But some of them, I just want to make sure that you know some things that I had to figure out little by little over the years. And then from there, we'll go ahead and answer your questions. Just so you know the format, each week we'll give a presentation, then answer questions, both live and people have pre-submitted questions, so we have a little list. But please... Uh, give us your live questions, and we'll go ahead and or answer them at the end of the presentation, along with the pre-submitted questions. Then at the very end, we'll do a drawing. On my Real Guitar Success membership site, people have completed a certain number of lessons. We call it the monthly practice plan. And when they complete it, they get entered into a drawing to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So let's go ahead and get started. Yeah. The care and feeding of your acoustic guitar feeding. <laughs> <laughs> My guitar needs feeding, I know that. So we've compiled a list of questions, and please add your questions as we're talking, and feel free, don't, you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. What's the first question? Uh, so first one here says, how often do I need, well, first thing is like, could you give instructions on the proper upkeep of the guitar? Of the guitar? Okay, so what's the first question? Um, how often do you need to change the strings? So. On the strings, it depends, first of all, on the type of guitar. This is a steel, uh, excuse me, a steel string acoustic guitar. And I usually change the strings depending on how much I play. That means for me, probably about every three months. I have been through periods, and I've seen students who don't change the guitar, the strings, even once a year. But the strings do tend to die, not just break, but the tone dies. And because it's a slow process, you don't notice it. They get darker and darker and lose their brilliance. Right. So I prefer to change them, even if you know, they still might look like they're good. Some of the signs are they start getting tarnished. If you listen careful, the tone of the guitar starts getting darker and darker and less brilliant. When you say darker, do you mean um, that like when you strum, the sound dies quicker? No, I mean that the sound um, is not as sharp and clear. I see. It's more muffled, and it gets more and more like that as the strings get older. Got it, okay. Yes, but the sustain does also start decaying. Mm -hmm. The sustain is how long the strings ring. Right, okay, I, I was curious about that myself. Yeah, yeah good. Um, so the next question is, how can I tell if a string needs to be changed? You kind of already said about that. One. One thing I didn't mention is often if I've played on a guitar for at least a month, let's say, maybe even two or three weeks, depending on how much I'm playing. By the way, the more you play, the strings do get um, tired faster mm -hmm. for two reasons. One is because you're constantly pressing them against the frets and they're being pounded on, but also there's oil in your fingers. And as you play the strings, the oil in your fingers has a little bit of acid. Mm -hmm. And the acid goes into the string and starts corroding usually the core of the string. You won't see it, but that's what creates that, uh, that deadening sound, the darker and darker sound. So you can extend the life of your strings by wiping them off every time you play. And some people have more acid in their fingers than others, so it's, it does vary. Hmm. In the oil in your fingers, rather. So one of the things that happens is I'll bust a string. And when I do, that's a, an indication I want to change the strings, if, if I put them on for at least a few weeks, three weeks. Because no matter what I do, when I put the new string on, it's going to sound different than the other strings. Right. So I want to change all the strings so they all sound even. Yeah, it's like getting your tires taken care of, right? If you well, yeah, buy a huh? set you of tires. At least rotate them or something. Yeah, you want to try to buy more than one at a time so you don't have one bald and the rest of them are totally good. And, of course, that is more pronounced the longer you've had your strings on your guitar. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So the other thing is sometimes you can see the corrosion on your strings or the discoloration. That's an indicator. But I'm mostly going by sound. I'm playing my guitar. I'm not really looking at the strings. I can say it's, it's starting just to not sound very bright. And yeah, it's been six months. Um, yeah, I haven't played a lot, but I could do better and I'll, get, I'll change the strings. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you don't mind. Felix, how often do you change your strings on your, on your like steel strings? Yeah, I would say 
around every six months or so. Gotcha. Yeah. It kind of just depends how often I've been playing and, yeah, and how they're sounding, how they're feeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you, like, the feel of them? How do you, how do you know when it's time? Um, definitely, like, tarnish mostly is, like, looking at them. Are they rusty, dirty? Um, That's when you see those little, like, black marks mm-hmm. on the no. strings. The tarnish. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and sometimes I also see, like, little crusties build up underneath the string. Uh-huh. Which is kind of gross. <laughs> That's a good sign. It's time to change it. It's just dirty all around. Yeah. yeah. Just to give you a, kind of a, a range, I know some professionals who change the strings every time they play. Uh, every time they do oh. a concert, I meant. Oh, every time okay. they do a performance. Gotcha. So they always put new strings on before every performance. And sometimes they're performing, you know, on tour, like, every day. Wow. Or two or three times a week. So they're changing often. Yeah. They want the best sound from yeah. the get-go. That's and when they change them, by the way, the strings tend to change pitch. So they don't want to change them just before a performance. Right. Steel strings, you'd want to change at least several hours before and tune them several times. Nylon string, uh, the classical guitar, rather, I change the night before because it really stretches. And I have to tune it half a dozen times before it'll start staying. Right. Right. Yeah, so I let them stretch all overnight usually yeah. before performance. Whenever we uh, have people bring guitars and stuff into the store, I always tell them, you know, I'll tune it up when they come pick it up and then tell them, hey, tomorrow you're going to have to tune it up again and just keep coming back at it and stretching the strings and all yeah. that stuff. Yep. Um, cool. So somebody asked, how do you string different types of guitars? So acoustic nylon, acoustic metal versus um, electric. Very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about electric, even though I have strung an electric guitar. That's not my forte. But I, um, I've both strung and taught people how to string acoustic and nylon string guitars. And I don't want to go into a step-by-step. That'll take it easy the hour mm-hmm. to show you how to change strings. But a couple of tips. When you're changing the strings on an acoustic guitar, it is a good time to... I'll, I'll cut the guitars off the string. First, I'll loosen the tension. If you don't, the string will pop, and it will hit you in the face oh, sooner or later. Been there, done that. Yeah, okay. I think we all have. So you loosen the strings, get them loose, then cut them all off. Take the strings off. Then polish your guitar. Clean the front of your guitar with guitar polish, and you can clean the fretboard at least with some fretboard cleaner. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's really crummy, sometimes you want to go a little farther and get some really fine steel wool and, and scrub the gunk off the frets. I, I hardly ever have to do that because I clean it more often than that. Then when you put the strings on, I like to take a string winder, pop the string. Oh, let me show you a string winder. By the way, a very valuable little tool, and they're mm-hmm. fairly inexpensive. This one's probably the most expensive, around eight bucks. I've gotten some online for like three or four bucks. Cheaper ones, of course. This is a good one. It has a little device where I can pop the pins off, take the strings off, unwind them from here. I've cut them already. Then, when you put the strings on, you take one string at a time and pull the string out just about two to three inches, not shorter than two inches, back it up, Make a little kink in it, and then use a string winder to wind it up. Mm-hmm. Without a string winder, it's just an unreasonable amount of time to wind it. And I even have an electric string winder at home, so I can. Uh-huh. Yeah, should I bring you guys? Around? That's we cool. have one. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. We have one. It just saves a lot of time. And of course, once I get tension on there, I'm not trying to tune it yet. I get all the strings on, then I go through and tune it up. I'll start tuning it up without getting too close, just getting it roughly in tune. Then I'll go back and tune it again and kind of fine tune it. I'll let it set for a while and then come back and tune it again. And usually it'll start staying pretty close at that point. Steel string. Now with the nylon string, let me grab one. There's a couple differences. First of all, like I said, count on the strings. Once you put them on, they're going to stretch for a much longer period of time. It'll keep going way out of tune. So if you know that, it's no big thing. You just do it ahead of time, tune it up a few times, let it set several hours, tune it up again, let it set a few more hours, tune it up again. The nylon string has this little windings. Now, there are strings that have a ball on them, Mm -hmm. but the good strings, the best strings don't have balls. That's just not what classical and flamenco people use. So you have to tie them. And that's a little tricky. I won't be able to go into it now. I'd have to actually take the time and string a guitar and show you but it's worth learning and I'll I'll post a link to a YouTube video yeah I did make some on the nylon string guitar oh cool and then with the other end here make sure you have a long enough I have more than once cut it too short Mm -hmm. and it takes a few more winds with the nylon string to stay 
As a matter of fact, what I prefer to do now, with, see there's three wound strings and three, I'll call them monofilament, they're just like fish line. The three fish line, when I put the strings on, I always go about three inches longer before I cut it. And then I back it up and I tie one simple little knot because I've had so many times that I get it all wound up and then the string slips out and I have to start all over yep. again. Yep, I double loop it when I do that. Oh, you double loop yep. it. Yep, so I feed it through once and then feed it through another time. Yeah, it sounds like another way to choose yeah. the same thing. I just do a simple knot. I wrap it through and then wrap it around itself once and tighten it and then go ahead and wind it. Yeah. So I'm trying to make it look neat at the same time. I've seen some people just leave the string uncut and trying to wind it, but it's really hard to do that. Yeah. It's really messy. So you, if you get good at knowing how long to cut it and how long to do it so you don't cut it too short, uh, it works pretty well. I would, if you have a hesitation, do a little longer than shorter. You can always continue to trim it after it's all strung up. Yeah. Mm, anything else on nylon string? Again, I just like to polish it up when I take strings off. Oh, I know there's something I need to mention. Hmm. There is a, um, uh, definitely people who have expensive guitars are hesitant, especially with nylon, handmade guitars, hesitant to cut all the strings off because there's tension on the neck and they don't want to release all the tension at once, they're afraid it'll damage the guitar. Mm -hmm. Now with an inexpensive guitar, I'm talking two, three hundred dollar guitar, I don't worry about that. But on an expensive handmade guitar, they're more delicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's realistic and I would cut the strings off one at a time and replace them so you're not just releasing all the tension and putting all the tension back on. I've never ever heard that. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I know that's not universal. Not everybody does that. I'd say I'd lean in that direction. But truth be told, more than once on my $8,000 guitar, I have cut all the strings off and put them on. And I haven't seen any damage. But if it did get damaged, the maker would probably say to me, hey, I, I warned you. <laughs> yeah, right. So just know that. And I, I guess that applies to acoustic guitars, but they seem in general sturdier than the... Yeah. The, it's a handmade uh, flamenco or classical guitar. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, I have one little trick that I do on mostly the acoustic, but sometimes the nylon too. I take a pencil when I'm restringing the guitar and I rub it into the, this is the nut of the guitar, into the little grooves. Oh. And what that does is puts a little graphite in there so when I tune it, they slide more easy and don't get caught. And getting caught is what makes for your tune tune. It's not going off of a sudden, it jumps and goes too high. Oh. Yeah. So this is in the nut, the grooves in the nut of the guitar. I always do it in a steel string and sometimes do it on a nylon string. Hmm. Never heard of that. That's yeah. cool. Um, I'm curious to know, Felix, if you had any extra stuff. Felix is kind of our string changing guru yeah. around these parts. I feel like you all pretty much covered it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a, a video on changing a steel string guitar. I have one for nylon. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll do a video together. Mm -hmm. Any tips on the electric? Just because I know it's one Thomas didn't really address. Um, I mean, I feel like the electric and the steel string acoustic are very similar in terms of especially um, winding the string up at the, the headstock. Uh, the only difference for the electric is how the strings will go through. A lot of them go through the body and the back. Oh, okay. And you may have to sometimes undo um, a cover to be able to access yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so just having like a, a little screwdriver or a Phillips head will help you get into that. Yeah. Um, Fender type guitar, so mm -hmm. you have to get the into the back. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing, just like if you are restringing your guitar on your own, one thing that I was taught was like, so you have your thicker strings, especially with even the nylon, you have these grooves on your, your lower pitch strings mm -hmm. that help um, the string catch when you're winding it. Mm -hmm. So what I was taught is like, yeah, you want about two and a half to three inches of slack there. But then on your higher pitch strings that don't have any winding, they don't catch as easily. So you want to give them a, just a little extra more wind. Slack. That yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. So they're less likely to slip out. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's it. Cool. Thanks. I just thought I'd ask. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, what care does the body of the guitar need? So I usually use a basic guitar polish for the guitar. I've heard some people use furniture polish. I've heard different opinions about that. Some people say, no, it has some fluorocarbons or something that could damage the finish. I think it depends. The older guitars were more susceptible to that. I know that. The newer guitars have a more stable finish on them. Mm -hmm. um, I like something like this, uh, just a kit which has a nice clean polishing cloth, a smooth one, and a guitar polish. I also like to use a fretboard cleaner. Not mm -hmm. everybody does that, and I know a lot of students don't. Yeah. But I have a separate fretboard cleaner that when I take the strings off, 
I clean the fretboard each time also. And that's one of the reasons I take all the strings off my nylon yeah, strings because I want to clean get the fretboard. Up. Yeah. yeah, I hear that. Um, and how do you clean the guitar with water, furniture, polish? Well, that's kind of what you just yeah. talked about. Yeah, about yeah. The body. and then do get a, uh, a soft cloth, a lint-free cloth. I, I have tried just any old rag, and then the lint comes off, and you're polishing your client, it looks like it's just getting just as dirty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what, is it, what does it mean by a setup for the guitar? A setup, let me uh, get the steel string again. A setup is a basic action adjustment for the guitar. In other words, the action is high, how, how high the strings are off the neck of the guitar. So when you play it, it's a combination of a variety of techniques. They're adjusting the height of the nut, this is the nut, adjusting the height of the bridge, and then the bridge is this saddle, that's a white piece there. And then they're adjusting the bow of the neck. The neck of the steel string acoustic has a rod inside, and they'll adjust the rod to bring the neck up. So it's not exactly straight, just slightly cupped up like that. So there's a little bit of an angle there. If it's too much, the strings will be too high up here. If it's back this way, they'll, they'll buzz up here before you get good action down here. And then finally, they'll, um, to do a full setup, they'll, when all the strings are off, they'll adjust the frets of the guitar. These are these little metal mm -hmm. frets. And what they're doing is make sure they're all even and smooth, polished. Now, for me, I don't do that. I have a professional guitar person do that, guitar maintenance person. And he will take a look at my action on all my good guitars and adjust them to the action that I like. The action is somewhat subjective. I prefer on the lower side, but not to where they're buzzing. And some people, especially with the flamenco guitars, like them to where they're so low they're buzzing. Mm. And then some people who do a lot of heavy finger picking or banging on the guitar, or yeah. I just, heavy picking is what I'm trying to say, they'll want the strings a little higher so they can hit harder without them buzzing. Mm. But in general, I let the guitar repairman do that. Right. So a setup is a combination of adjusting the, all the little components that make for the best action for that particular guitar and the guitar player. Is, is the action on the guitar, specifically on Dreadnought, something that has to be adjusted often, or does it ever change or slip? Uh, it definitely can change. I notice, and I've been told this over the years, that less expensive guitars, it tends to change more often, because what's happening is the wood is adjusting to uh, humidity and temperature, and mm. the neck is uh, moving a little mm. bit. Better guitars, they've aged the wood longer or used uh, technology now. They put them in a special room. Right. So that the wood is less likely to move. I have only adjusted all my good guitars one time. Mm, you know, I, I wouldn't say they'd never need adjustment again, but uh, it's not something I'm expecting to do often. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. Uh, let's see. After I buy a guitar, is there ever any need to take it to a professional guitar lab? I prefer almost every time I buy a new guitar to have it adjusted. Now, I did have the, uh, that uh, Yamaha guitar I bought. Yeah. And I have never adjusted that. The adjustment was great. The ACR one? Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of a hit or miss. Even expensive guitars, I've had to do little minor adjustments. But mm -hmm. um, I would say... If you have an inexpensive guitar, it might be worth at least to have a repairman look at it and see what they could do without spending a lot of money to just get a little better action. Right, right. Um, how should your guitar be stored? I would store it in a case for sure. Mm -hmm. And depending on where I'm storing it and how long, uh, it would be a better case or a softer case, a harder case or a softer case. Yeah. I would um, definitely not put it in the car, the heat from the sun. Right. will uh, cause havoc just with the strings and also the wood of the guitar. Heat and, and um, humidity are the two problems that um, affect guitars. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep it out of a wet basement. You want to keep it out of a, uh, an area that's going to get damp or extreme temperature changes, you know, too hot and too cold. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it out in the shed if it's a good guitar and you, if you care about it because uh, at, in the winter or in cold at nighttime, it's gonna get very cold and then get hot in the daytime. And that temperature fluctuation is what will cause the problems. A common one where we are is I have a lot of folks come in that live on boats. Oh, yeah. humidity or Yeah, seals? humidity, I mean, just also, all of it, all of the elements. <laughs> I've had uh, a lot of Navy people, uh, when this used to be a Navy town, say that when they bring their guitar on the boats, they have a problem with the uh, salt, the air, 
with yeah. salt water in the air and it uh, corrodes their strings faster and yeah. damages their guitar. Yeah, I've heard that same thing from a few folks. For, for that, uh, some people use a humidifier in their case. Here, normally, we don't need a humidifier, but yeah. in very dry climates, they use a humidifier to keep a little bit of moisture in the case or a little slice of an apple. You know, as it dries, yeah, it really slow humidity. Or in very in moist places, you put uh, something that sucks out the air. Dehumidifier. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Here, this temp, this climate doesn't need either of those. It's kind of nice in the middle. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And um, does it matter what kind of case I have? Well, it it is subjective. Uh, ideally, um, no, I shouldn't say ideally. I used to think a hard case was always the best because I want to protect my guitar. Mm. But I got so tired of carrying around this heavy wood mm -hmm. case. As a matter of fact, it made it so I didn't want to play that often because it was such a pain. Mm -hmm. So I have moved over to what I call a fusion case. So let me explain. There's hard cases. Now, hard cases the traditionally are made out of wood with the soft padding on the inside and vinyl on the outside. Mm -hmm. But now there's a lot of plastic, or polycarbonate, they call it, mm -hmm. which are molded cases out of a type of plastic, lighter and just as, I think, as protective as the wood cases. And there's even a newer case called a carbon fiber case, which is very light but still very protective, very expensive also. You won't see them that often. I happen to have one. They're, they started at about 400 bucks. <laughs> Yeah, you can go up to a, <laughs> close to a thousand bucks for the for the case. Again, you know, not that common. Yeah. Then you'd have the soft case or the gig bag, mm -hmm. and often we'll have students use a gig bag, especially with electric guitars. There's not a lot that can uh, smash the electric guitar other than the finish. Yeah. So they're they're put them on their back, their backpacks. Um, they're very light, very little padding usually, but mm -hmm. they're made to be very easy to carry around. I use a case that's in between. It looks like a gig bag, but it has a firm foam and a plastic inside the um, canvas mm -hmm. so that it has, if you hit it, it actually has some resistance. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't drop a, lead, a heavy lead weight on it and see what happens, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I can bump it and it's not really hitting the guitar. Yeah. Now, that's what I use because I will carry my guitar with me, even on my back, mm -hmm. and that's enough protection. I just make sure I don't put it in somewhere where somebody's going to land on it right. or fall on it. And that includes my, my very expensive guitars. Mm -hmm. I also use that on the plane. So here's mm -hmm. my thinking. A lot of people ask me how to travel with their guitar because I've traveled a lot. To me, if, if you're going to check it onto the plane, there is no case that is strong enough except for a very over-the-top amble. Those are travel cases for professional musicians who are touring mm -hmm. and they're expensive and they're really heavy and they're not something you want to carry around but you can check it online they're basically wood and metal and and padding and you know they weigh a ton as well yeah. it's not something you normally carry around so for the most part I'm carrying my guitar on the plane with me I'm not going to check it in yeah. even if I have a hard case a, a basic wood hard case so I use my gig bag, and that gig bag makes it small enough that I can put it in the overhead, and I almost always get on. My guitar I travel with is a nylon string. It's slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. I understand steel string, the acoustic's a little bit bigger, maybe not as easy, but that's my recommendation is try to get it on the plane. By the way, do put it in a case, any case. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who tried to take his guitar on the plane without a case at all. Yeah, they said no. He said, but I don't care. It gets damaged. I'll sign whatever wave here. I just want to put it in the overhead. No. He had to leave the guitar, period. They will not let him take it wow. without a case. So it wasn't a matter of getting damaged. He was willing to release liability. They just would not let it on Wouldn't the guitar. Wouldn't let it on. on. Even the overhead with the other case. Interesting. I guess because also if there was something happened, it fell out. If a string I popped guess. and hit somebody in the head. I, I don't, don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. But okay. I wouldn't try it. No. <laughs> um, and that was actually one of the last questions that was kind of a part of the lesson plan is how to travel on a plane with a guitar. Great. So the answer is a case. Are there any questions live you guys have yeah. about taking care of your guitar before we go on to the next list of questions that people have pre-submitted? We do have a couple of live questions. One's sure. from Shulamit, which by the way, thank you Shulamit. This was Shulamit's yes. suggestion. Welcome Shulamit. This was her idea. Um, is there a brand of strings that you recommend? Ah, good question. Um, for steel string, by the way, I, I'm not hardcore about any brand. I have found over the years that there are lots of brands, but really very few factories that make the strings. Mm. So it's like a lot of products. 
Many brands, but really a lot of them are made in the same factory. So there's two parts to a string. There's the basic core element, and then there's that winding. First of all, a manufacturer makes the core elements, and then another, usually manufacturer, actually puts the winding on the wound strings. A lot of, there's only like two factories that make the core elements, so they're all using the same basic materials. Now, a lot of the uh, brands have their own winding factory. Dear Dario is one of the biggest with the newest machines. Matter of fact, I happen to know that another popular manufacturer actually got old the Dario machines when they replaced them all with their new ones. And I, I find them consistent, uh, affordable. I use mostly the Dario strings. So for steel string, I use a light gauge phosphor bronze. There's also a bronze, which tends to be a little brighter, but they die faster. I mm -hmm. prefer the phosphor bronze, kind of a sound that stays longer. And light gauge is good, and it's enough volume and tone, but still fairly easy to press down. They make a extra light, they're a little too thin for me, mm -hmm. and they make a medium. People who hit hard or are playing a style where they want to be loud and sing along yeah. might want to do mediums, but I find the light gauge best. Mm -hmm. For my nylon string guitar, I use a Pro Arte. Um, uh, they call it Pro Arte. It's by Diderio also. Now, this is a normal gauge and probably good for most nylon string guitars. I use a hard gauge. That just means thicker and heavier because the style I'm playing, this flamenco style, I want the tone and I want to project out. So I use a hard gauge, and they even have an extra hard, or they call it hard and extra hard. I'll go between the two. On my um, rhythm guitar, I'll tend to use the hard gauge, and when I'm doing, uh, I have two guitars. The other one where I do a lot of melodies, I'll use the extra high tension. That's what they call it, high tension. Mm -hmm. High and extra high. And mm, these are the 80-20. Some people really like these, and I, I can still recommend them. They're a little less expensive than mm -hmm. Foster Bronze. Some people like that bright sound. Some people like to put them on and let it die away, and they like the darker sound. Mm -hmm. But I find most people would be more happy with the, um, the Foster Bronze. So this, they call it 80-20 Bronze and Foster Bronze. That's the yeah. two main compositions. By the way, there is one other string, and I had somebody ask about this. It's a coded string. So what they do is they take a regular uh, acoustic guitar string and they coat it with a very thin polycarbonate type of synthetic material. Mm -hmm. And it makes the string last longer. The acid that I mentioned before doesn't get into the string as easily. This string apparently has another brand of coated string and it sounds fine. I would have thought that the coating made the treble die away, but yeah. doesn't sounds fine to me. Um, I had one customer say they put coated strings on and it peeled after a few months. I've never had that happen. I, that's, that's the first time I've heard of that, but I'll keep an eye out for it. The two popular brands are Diderio, and they just call them coated. EXPs. EXPs, okay. Mm -hmm. And my staff tells me that these, they like these the best. They sound the best. They just don't quite last as long as the other brand, the Elixirs, which have a thicker coating, which causes it to have a little less of the high end, the Christmas, but they stay on longer. Mm -hmm. Elixirs is kind of the first, the pioneer in that. Right. Elixir, uh, what do they call them? Nano Web. Yeah, yeah. Nano Web. And the Dario came on later. I, kn I know they're a good seller here. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, we have another live question from Mr. Pesky1. Why are there differences in nut width? Are two and 11 16th inches and two and three quarter inches designed for different kinds of playing? That I will say I don't really know. Mm. Um, I, always, I always thought, and I won't pretend an expert on this, that the nut width has to do with the guitar. Certain guitars were just made to have a, a different nut width. And whenever I've talked to a guitar repairman, the only issue has come up, what nut width does my guitar need, not what style of play. But there might be something I don't know about that, too. Yeah, I don't know. Felix, do you know anything about that? Um, not, like, for certain, but I'm just kind of thinking about it and wondering, you know, different nut width means your strings are going to be spaced out slightly differently, so maybe wider nut for more finger picking or slimmer nut if you don't need to get between the strings as much but that's really just an educated guess yeah yeah all right we have kathy who i think just wanted a quick recap question how do i know when it's time to replace my hi, kathy. strings hi kathy 
Um, we said that you look for corrosion on the strings. Think about how long they've been on the guitar. Certainly, if it's a year, it's definitely time, no matter what. Yeah. Six months, probably time. Um, if you're playing a lot, you can gauge it between three and six months. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have more acid on your fingers and you're not wiping them, that will mean probably sooner than later. If you wipe your guitar and are very careful, you could probably keep them on a little bit longer. And then finally, which is you know a little more subtle, but what I'm listening for is the the sound of the good strings. As the crispness dies away, that's when I want to change strings. I hear them not as crisp. Right. I also take into account what I'm doing. If I'm going to do a new recording session, I'm going to be pickier. I want new strings the best possible. If I'm not doing any recording for weeks, I'm going to be a little more tolerant. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Okay. And uh, Paul says, have you seen the color-coded strings? What are your thoughts on them? Hmm, I don't know that. I do. I've seen them. I, I believe the ones I've seen have been maybe Ernie Ball, maybe not, but they do have like brightly colored strings, mainly for electric. Oh. Mainly for electric. They'll have like neon pink, neon green, just... I think for the Is it just for looks? I think so. I think so. And Paul, maybe if, you, if you're here still and you have any other info on that, add it in and we can come back to it. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that's my, my understanding. That's a new one for me. Hey, mm -hmm. I want pink strings on my guitar. I think I saw them at the NAMM show or something. Like, I've definitely seen them before somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So we have a couple of pre-submitted questions, too. And for those of you that are live, please do keep submitting the questions. We'll throw them in there. Um, so this is from Richard, who submitted ahead of time. It says, when I use a capo on the second fret, or any fret for that matter, what key does that then become? I want to play a song that calls for a capo on the second fret without using a capo. How do I figure that out? Okay, two separate questions. When you put a capo on your guitar, let's say second fret, just mm -hmm. to be clear, mm -hmm. what key is it in? Well, it depends on what key you were in. Whatever key you were in, you just went up one fret, two fret, that's two half steps or one whole fret. I mean, one whole step. I, mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I said it right that time. One whole step. So you need to know the musical alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know that there's whole steps between every note except B and C and E and F. Mm -hmm. Those are half steps. So if you go up, if you're in the key of, you're playing the key of A and you put your capo here, you go up one step. A, one whole step is to B. If you were in the key of C, again, one whole step. C, C sharp, D. Mm -hmm. So capo here means everything, if you play the same, you're now in the key of D. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're in the key of B to start, but you put a capo on one whole, uh, um, the second fret. That's one whole step. B to C is a half step, so you need another half step, that's C sharp. Mm -hmm. So now you're, everything's in the key of C sharp if you play all the same chords. Chord forms, I should say, because they're actually sounding different. Yeah. A C here with a, two, a fret on the, sec, with a capo on the second fret, is now D, in capo there. If I were to play it, look like it. something like that. C goes to D. Yeah. It's a D chord now, yeah. but it looks like the C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the second part of that question is how do I figure out if the song says put capo here and now it's in the key of D, what key is it in when I take the capo off? How can I get it back up to the key of D? Well, you basically have to figure out what, with the capo on, what key it was in before you put the capo on. Mm -hmm. and, and then go back a step on every chord. Right. So if you put your capo here, that's one full step. So if, if you're playing a D chord form here, I'm sorry, let's see. If you're, whatever form you're playing, it turns into a D. You're actually playing a C form, but it sounds like a D. I just, one whole step, you'd have to play a, a D here. See, listen. This is a C form, but then that's capo. Now you have to play a D. So what I'm doing is basically calculating with every chord what would be the chord without the capo. Mm -hmm. But I want it to sound the same. So you're changing the form to make the same sound. Yeah. A C, up one whole step, C, C sharp, D, I play a D chord. Uh, an E, I go up one up. E to F, that's half step, F sharp. Now we have to play an F sharp. And so on. Yeah, that's exactly how I would explain that too. Yep, 
Uh, and it, again, just a side note on that, it just means you got to know your chromatic scale, right? You got to know. Yes, just just for the record too, I wouldn't consider this a beginning guitar skill. Yeah. Uh, that's not something I would do. As a matter of fact, if I were just starting out or I had a student starting out, I wouldn't. There's several parts of that. They have to know the musical alphabet. They have to get better at calculating, you know, changing keys, right. basically. I would say, you know, if it's only on the second fret, I would try just playing the same chords without the capo. It's only one step down. That's not a big difference. It, you could probably easily sing it one step down just yeah. as easily. It's yeah. probably not worth changing all the chords for one step. If, um, if it's really too high for your voice and you want to go down, okay, maybe. But yeah. That's it. I'd and, say that's of marginal use compared to other skills. Yeah, and I remember actually recently, Richard, we did an RGS live session on transposing. So yeah. um, we can always, you know, you can always kind of like look back at that. You may get some more tips and ideas on. Not only that, Richard, that. but if you're if you're a member of Real Guitar Success, there is a whole section on changing keys, and I encourage you to go through that using a capo and changing keys because I talk about all those different issues. And even though I don't specifically talk about how the change down without the capo, all that all that's taught in there applies to the skills that you need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to go back just a little bit, Paul did respond about the colored strings um, and was saying that's exactly what we're referring to, not the brand. So I would say look into the brand. I, I don't know much about them enough to be able to recommend them or not. I've never seen them. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, you can always post post in the comments later a link I'd be interested to take a look at those and kind of learn about them myself um, we have another live question from Shane uh, well actually he says comment on guitar action and playing style I play a lot of slide on both acoustic and electric and need to raise the action yeah. especially on electrics to avoid buzzing up the frets yeah that makes sense I have heard that I don't play slide but I have heard that from other slide players they're basically raising the action to, to use the slide right and uh, cool we have another pre-submitted question from Steve. Steve says, do you have exercises for changing bar chords from say a B to a B major seventh? I don't have any trouble barring major chords. It's when I have to switch the pinky, third, and middle finger from that E formation on a bar chord to something like a major seventh chord. Okay, so from, I understand the question. He's talking about making a, I'll call it a root six major bar chord. That's the first one most people learn. It's basically an E chord moved up with the bar. So that's a G, A, and B. And we call it root six because the name of the note is on the sixth string. So when I play a G, that's a G note on the sixth string third fret. And he's talking going to a major seventh. Now, when we're talking bar chords, the only way I know to make a major seven is this way. I can also make a major seventh this way, but I wouldn't call that a bar. I wouldn't call that a bar chord. So I'll assume he's talking about making a major seven like this, and he's having a hard time moving from here to here. So I'm gonna use the G because the B would be harder because it's way up here. I wanna start with a chord that's easier to practice. And as a student, Steve, I would say, first thing to do is just practice the motion and think of this as something you're gonna make a program on. In other words, you're gonna work on it. You're not just gonna have a technique and all of a sudden you can just do it. It takes training your fingers to make the movements without having to think too hard about it. Mm -hmm. And my first step is that is to just, every day you practice your guitar, start with this basic warm up of just moving without strumming. Because what I'm doing is eliminating whether or not they're buzzing or sounding bad, I'm just making the motion. So start with that. By the way, I said every day that you practice your guitar. No, do it every day. <laughs> and if you're not planning on practicing anything else, just do this a little bit, maybe twice a day. I'm talking just a minute. Then another round of strum the chord. Take about 10 seconds just to refine it if it's not sounding right. And when you get over here, so now you're working on getting the notes just right. You're making small adjustments, but not on changing them in time. You see, I can, I'm taking my time changing, so that's not, we're not practicing that yet. Then the next step is, again, one minute on that, max. Then practice with a metronome changing the chords from maybe just twice and then change. Now you're practicing getting from one to the other and go as slow as you need to to actually make the change. Then little by little, as you go on day after day, you start picking up the speed and see if you can push yourself a little bit. Yeah. Then finally, I'd give you a more elaborate exercise. After you've done that, I don't want to give you an exercise that involves a bunch of chords when you're just working on 
focusing on this basic change. So here's a more elaborate exercise that I would recommend. Uh, here's, I'll, I'll play it and I'll also make a link to the sheet music here somewhere. Because it's a common progression that uses both of these chords. You hear it? I'm going C major seven to F major, B flat major seven to E seven, A major seven, A minor seven. Now start again, that's a D minor seven to G to C major seven to F. You recognize that sound? B flat major seven, E seven, and then I end on A minor. That's the exercise, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a, sh a link to a sheet so you can get that to practice it. It's a common progression. It happens to be also very close to the progression Santana uses in the song Europa. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I've simplified it a little bit. It's mm -hmm. uh, both the rhythm and uh, a couple of the chords, but um, it makes it a better exercise the way I do it. But Europa is very, it's the same sound. You could play the melody to this chord progression. Yeah, it's a beautiful little chord progression. I had to you. write that down. Yeah, it is. It's pretty. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Um, let's see. We have Niumaya. I believe that's how you say your name. Apologies if it's incorrect. Is it necessary to detune your guitar when you're done for any particular day and then tune it up again the same time following day? I'll let you take that one. No. No. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You're causing a lot more work for yourself than what needs to be. She mentioned to me, which I forgot, that violinists have to unloosen their bow every time, so that's mm -hmm. not a far-fetched idea, but boy, that would be rough. Because yeah. every time you loosen the strings and tighten them, they're gonna stretch again, and you'll have, to keep, you'll have to keep tuning them. You can't just tune it and it stays. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, and that'll wear your strings out, too, going loose, tight, loose, tight. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, the constant tension probably wouldn't be good for your guitar, either, to probably con not. consistently be messing Yeah, that's true, tension. huh? That's against what the uh, good uh, the classical guitar maker told me that you don't want to take all the strings, loosen all the tension at once. Yeah. Because you're risking damaging your, your fine, expensive guitar. Right. Okay. Uh, Joe says, my question is regarding recoded strings. I bought the strings and a few months later they started peeling. I think this is the one you were talking about oh, earlier. Yeah. Are they a gimmick? Plus, are there different thicknesses of strings? Um, there are different thicknesses of strings. Which ones should I choose as an intermediate? So they're not a gimmick. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of people that love coated strings. Mm -hmm. Again, the brands Elixir and Diderio, I don't know what brand you bought. Maybe there's some off generic brand that doesn't hold up, but I've never heard that with the uh, major brands Elixir or Diderio. Mm -hmm. And for an intermediate player, it, there's more to it than that. It has to do with the style you're playing, your guitar. I couldn't tell you what gauge of strings you should be using just by your level. And even ironically, intermediate doesn't really tell me what level you are because yeah. an, a student who is intermediate could be very different from a professional looking at intermediate. Mm -hmm. um, it's two different worlds yeah. and, and all there's a bunch in between. So I don't know what, exactly what you mean by intermediate. I get you're not a brand new beginner, right? And you're probably not a pro doing uh, touring concerts. I would say you're, you can't go wrong with a good light gauge Diderio Foster Braun string. Yeah. And you might want to experiment with a medium gauge and see if you're, you know, the, it's a little hard to press and maybe the benefit is you get a little louder volume. See if that's a benefit for you. If not, go back to light gauge. Probably not going to use extra light, but, you know, if your fingers are really sore, you might want to go to extra light for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fair, fair assessment. All right, we have Mark who says, two-part question, one, how do you check the neck of the guitar for cupping or back bow? And if found, what can you do about it? Okay, for checking, I, I look down the neck of the guitar and I keep both eyes open. I try one eye and it works actually better with both eyes, even though it's a little distracting. And I'm looking to see the string from the um, end of the fretboard. And I can see this one's not bad. What I'm looking for is a nice slight angle up. I'm looking for a neck that's just slightly cupped, but not too much, so that I get a uh, a fairly consistent slope and not too high. Now, if the neck is back bowed like that, I probably want to fix that. I want it just slightly, he calls cupped. I've never heard that word, but I get the idea. I want it slightly bowed front bow. 
And if it's too much, I'm going to have it close to the uh, fretboard down there and too high up here. So mm -hmm. that I would want to tighten the truss rod inside the steel string guitar. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a nylon string guitar, it's a different issue. There's no truss rod usually. They do have a, a repairman has a way of heating up the neck in a clamp and making some adjustments on the neck with mm -hmm. heat and pressure. Um, they've done that to one of my guitars. And it, it's small adjustments. I don't have them, you know, make big. It's not a major wide, surgery. Yeah. Um, what you can do about it is bring it to a, a repairman. Yeah. Some people do adjust their own guitar. I don't. And I, I wouldn't pretend to be able to either teach people that. I'd be afraid to even if I knew how to do it. And I wouldn't do it for my own guitar. I would bring it to a competent repairman. Makes sense. Oh, there are videos, and I can even put a link to it. There's one good one I know about on YouTube about, you know, how to do your own guitar adjustments. And I would leave that up to, you know, again, a guitar repairman who knows all the ins and outs. And uh, up to you if you're willing to take that risk. Because if you have an expensive guitar and you do something wrong, you're liable to have to deal with it. Yeah. Um, second part of that question is, how do you check the intonation of a guitar and reset it? Uh, again, I don't do that. Yeah. I send it to a guitar repairman. And I understand the idea. You can do some basic uh, intonation adjustment or assessment by hitting the, the um, harmonic here on the 12th fret and then listening to the string. So that's fine. Now I'm going to hit the E here and press E here. Now I'm actually making uh, an E that's an octave higher, and I'm listening to see if they're fairly in tune. And in this case, it sounds pretty good. If it sounds way off, you know your guitar needs some intona intonation adjustments. Mm -hmm. All right. Eduardo says, what exercises do you recommend for better pinky use and for bar chords? Mm. Uh, pinky use, I deal with that. When you're a beginner, I have students do a basic exercise that looks like this. Oh, the caterpillar. Oh, yeah. Let, let uh, Ami show you the caterpillar. She does this with her uke students. Yeah. So, I mean, uke is notably smaller than the guitar. Uh, but the basic idea is that you play open first fret, second fret, third fret, fourth fret for every of your strings. Um, but the hardest part and the important key is that you only switch strings when it's that finger, or you only move fingers when it's that finger's turn to move. So if I go open one, two, three, four, and then I go to my E string, I'm gonna do open, and then just my fourth, my pointer, just my middle, just my ring, and just my pinky. Um, these two in particular, the ring and the pinky, are typically the hardest for students. And then you keep that going. And it forces you to really like strengthen those muscles and tendons all up in there and make them go backwards. And then I do recommend bringing it up the different frets. So you keep the same open one, two, three, four pattern with your fingers, but the action gets a little bit higher up the instrument as you go. So eventually you end up here and you have to learn how to kind of adjust. So a guitar equivalent of that is I start on the fifth fret and just go up one fret at a time and then move over. Go slow, I'm just showing you fast, just to show you that I'm going backwards. Then, if, if you do that for a while and you get fair at it, start going down, one fret at a time, until you get all the way down here. Mm -hmm. As you get closer to the nut, the reason I start up here is that the frets are farther apart down here. So as you get closer to the nut, it's more of a stretch. Mm -hmm. That will strengthen the pinky, yep. and it'll start the stretching process. Yes. Great exercise, and I encourage um, brand, brand new beginners. I do a simpler mm -hmm. version, starting without the pinky, and then I add the pinky. Mm -hmm. But if this is easy for you, and maybe you've been doing it for a while, I'll show you a next level up, which I do with a little more advanced students. It's a hammer-on and pull-off pinky exercise, and it definitely strengthens the pinky. It's a, it's a couple steps above the one we just showed you. It looks like this. Hammer on, and I'll do several on the pinky. I'm fifth fret. I wanted to get up here for a reason. Now I go back down. Now I pull off. Oh, this is a pinky workout.
and so on all the way back down. Do that every day for three weeks and you will have a strong peak. I bet you will. <laughs> that exercise, if you're a member, um, uh, just send me a quick email and I'll, I'll send you a link to it. It's on the uh, membership site. Awesome. Both. Good. And the last question of the day, unless you all have some more live questions, um, how to improve ear training and how can one learn songs by ear? Hmm. This is Ami's specialty. <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there, um, there are some tips that you can definitely have. One, listen to music. It's like cliche and easy as that sounds. Listen to music. Um, typically what I recommend students do to help start the process of learning how to um, basically kind of train your ear in order to prepare yourself to play songs um, is start by like some note matching. So if you're listening to a song that you like and there's a little phrase in there, see if you can find even just one or two of those notes on your instrument. It can be as simple as, you know, you're listening to a song and you hear a phrase and you like, uh, 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 kind of sounds like the note maybe up in here somewhere. Okay, find that and then you can figure out what note that is and that may help you start to piece things together. So that's just like a very good baseline way to start some ear training. It's just see if you can hear something and try and find it. Um, my tip is to do that often um, because you're, I mean, you're, you know, your ear is like connected to your brain. These are all muscles and ideas that you can practice that will get better over time. So you may not, you may not be good at it when you first start. Um, so be patient with yourself and sort of enjoy that. I would also recommend doing some note matching. So like even with your voice, because that helps kind of reinforce mm. what you're hearing. I mean, you don't have to be the world's best singer in order to exercise your voice and let it assist you in your music learning. Mm. So those are some tips on improving ear training. And there are lots of other exercises and things out there too that can be really helpful. I use exercises with my students. I call by copy playing. Mm -hmm. So I, I have these short videos where I play and then have the student play it back. And the idea is, as time goes on, to not look at what I'm playing, but just listen and copy me. And I repeat stuff over and over, so it gives them a chance to get simpler versions and they get more complex as they go up. Yeah. And another thing, it, I think if you want to learn songs by ear, it's really helpful to learn the chords in keys. Yeah. That way, what you do is you hear a song, you determine what key is in, and then you know what chords tend to go in that key. There's no absolute, mm -hmm. but tend to go in that key, and you're much e it's a much easier time finding the chords when you kind of narrow it down. Yeah. So I, you know, I use lessons on how to find a key. I use a, a system of listening to the bass note of the song and see which bass note sounds right. And then I teach students to play the chords in certain keys so they get used to hearing the chords that belong in each of the keys. The popular keys, not all keys. The guitar has five popular keys. Remember, we did this before. Uh, it goes uh, in, in the circle of fifth. C, C G, G, D. D. I'm circle fourths in my head. C, a, G, D, A, E. E. Yeah. Yeah, and those are the popular keys for guitar. Start there. There's no point in going all the flat keys or sharp keys when you're going to use them very, very seldom. Right. Here's another tip that I use with my students. I, I do that as well. Um, actually, for, for lesson mates, that's when my students can't make it to a lesson, um, I will just do an audio recording and they have to come back being able to play what I played for them. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, so that's a tough one. But here's a good one. Start with a song that you know, a really simple one. Say like Mary Had a Little Lamb or um, uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So I was doing this exercise on piano at my parents' house the other day where I was playing Mary Had a Little Lamb with this little bass line. I don't play piano, by the way. And um, I kept changing keys on purpose. Oh. So I did it one So that's a good way to kind of help your brain. So if you can start in the key of C. So like if I want to do Mary Had a Little Lamb, it's got these three main notes in it. So once you get that little melody in your head, see if you can find the chords that may go with it. So if you're like, Mary had a little lamb, you're not going to go like this, little lamb, that doesn't quite match. That may sound good, little lamb, little lamb, so you want to find little things that match, and find things that don't match, because that's how you find the things that do. So you can try like, Mary had a little, mm, 
Not quite there, right? So you can kind of bounce around. Although Felix may say that it could be there. You can make some cool dissonant version of Mary Had a Little Lamb or something. <laughs> <laughs> so again, that really helps if you know the common chords in each of the keys. Exactly. The, the main keys you use for guitar. Yeah. All right. So I think those are all the questions for today. I think it's time to do the raffle. Cool. Let's do a raffle. All right. Let's see. And we've got the Ernie Ball hat full of, these are people who have completed the practice sessions for the month of September. Very studious group of people. Ah, Ian. Ian. Ian, congratulations, Ian. You are the winner. I'll be sending you the Amazon gift card today, actually. Yes. And for all of you who have completed, the real winner is... The real winning is completing the lessons and the education that you get out of it. Thank you for playing along. I look forward to seeing you next month, the first Tuesday of the month. November 5th. November 5th. She, know, she knows these things. <laughs> and in the meantime, feel free to submit questions ahead of time and get them in early. Bye for now. Bye. See you next time. Say bye, Felix. Bye, everybody. <laughs>